everyone. Thank you for listening to our fifth webinar of the 2023 CKF webinar series. This webinar will focus on minority and transplant. Currently, 60, nearly 60% 60 of the transplant waiting lists are from multicultural communities. In honor of National Minority Donor Awareness Month, we are here with leaders of the community to discuss the world of transplants for minorities. My name is Calvin Matthew. I'm an intern for the Chris Klug Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's panelists and moderating today's session. I would first like you to, uh, to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rust Foundations, who helped make the series possible. Thank you to all of those who have submitted questions before today's session. If you have further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org. If you are interested in other topics we will discuss during this year's series, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CFK webinar series. Now, I would like to introduce today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves and their companies. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Clive Callender, renowned transplant surgeon and the founder of the MOTTEP. Uh, thank you very much for letting me join you. Uh, Nas the National Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program actually started off uh, National Minority Donor Awareness Month. And so I'm excited to tell you that, uh, you know, we started this effort back in 1996. Uh, it started off as a week uh, celebration, but because of the success of it, uh, we expanded it to from a day to a week, and then in 2020, we expanded it from a week to a month. And so we're excited because we, we recognize that the number one problem in transplantation today is the shortage of donors. And uh, since people of color make up more than 60% of those people waiting, it's just appropriate that we should have, take time to really do what we can to increase the number of minorities who are aware and who participate in organizations donation and transplantation. Next, Selena Espinoza, the Director of External Affairs for New Mexico Donor Services. Hello everyone, we are so honored to participate in this webinar. My name is Selena Espinosa. I'm the External Affairs Director at New Mexico Donor Services. We are the organ procurement organization that services the entire state of New Mexico, so about 2 million people. And we have a very unique population in New Mexico and are excited to share our knowledge. Phil Shine is a transplant recipient and advocate for Asian American recipients nationwide. Hi, my name is Phil Shin, and this September I will be celebrating my four-year transplant anniversary. In September of 2019, I underwent a liver transplant via living, uh, living organ donation from a good friend of mine named Mark. Um, Back in 2018, I had been diagnosed with uh, liver cancer, uh, specifically uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a rare cancer of the liver. So um, in May of 2018, I had a, a resection of the liver to remove uh, a large tumor from the left lobe of my liver. And um, unfortunately, the cancer recurred and I was given the news that my only curative path would be a liver transplant. Um, being in such good health, um, receiving a transplant through a deceased donor was not really an option. Um, so uh, we were recommended to pursue a living liver donation uh, from uh, a healthy individual who met all the matching criteria to become my uh, donor. So we waited a good six to nine months before we received that amazing uh, gift of life from my friend Mark. So the reason why I'm speaking to you today is um, as well as being a grateful liver transplant recipient, um, I'm also a proud Asian American, uh, Korean American, um, and the topic today, it's really to discuss, you know, uh, minorities and transplant and 
As a proud minority uh, living here in Southern California, um, the liver transplant clinic that I was taking care of over at uh, Keck Medical Center of USC, uh, it's in an urban area of Los Angeles, which is primarily an urban region. Um, and I think back to getting that first diagnosis of having liver cancer and being in a waiting room and looking around that waiting room you know, I didn't really see a whole lot of white people, to be honest. I saw a lot of uh, Hispanics, uh, African Americans, and a couple of Asians. And, you know, it never really dawned on me that, you know, although being very well aware of my minority status in this country, um, didn't really view myself as a minority. Um, experiencing uh, this transplant journey. It was really, hey, we're all in this room together fighting for our lives to uh, get a cure for this liver disease that each of us are experiencing and hopefully move on, you know, to live a very healthful and fruitful life post-transplant. So, but I'm very well aware of the studies about the inequities of, um, of you know, this transplant journey. Um, uh, and I, I can't really speak to my own experience with, you know, not being treated equally. Uh, because again, I, I was in a pool of largely uh, minority citizens uh, waiting for a transplant or just, you know, having to fight this liver disease. So I think what my message is, is um, through representation and through voice and through stories like myself and others that were in that waiting room or that are being taken care of at Keck, if we raise our voices together, individually, yes, but together, then we can create advocacy. <laughs> For each other, um, that we can equip, you know, those of you know the, those other um, patients waiting for transplant to get an understanding of what this journey looks like, what their options are, what their um, um, what their uh, what rights they have. Uh, and what questions that they're supposed to ask to advocate for themselves because they're not alone. They're not alone at the, in this at all. And um, by creating these stories and having these conversations, whether it's through other folks uh, that look like them, themselves uh, or through a transplant support group, you can you can create those communities for yourself uh, and know that you're not going to be alone and that you are going to be taken care of just as equally as those that are not a minority. So, and I'm here for it. Um, if you feel like you're not being fully represented by your own um, doctors or your uh, healthcare providers and reach out to me, reach out to others, you know, in this Chris Kluke uh, Foundation family to find a voice that will speak for you. And then not only that, equip you <laughs> with the same language that we're all experiencing together through this adversity, because there will be a finish for you to ultimately get your transplant Thank you for that brief introduction. Now we'll move on to your PowerPoint. I'm glad to share with you the evolution of the National Minority Donor Awareness Month. Uh, and uh, the next slide points out that I don't have any disclosures because uh, in this day and age, that's an important question. And then the, the next the next slide uh, uh, talks about uh, what our objective is to tell you about how we evolved the National Minority Donor Awareness Day week 
month. Next slide points out that uh, the number one problem in transportation is actually the shortage of donors. It always has and always has been the number one problem. And uh, the next slide uh, points out that uh, when things, when I first got started, uh, we recognized in 1982 that minorities represented more than 50% of those waiting, but only 15% of the entire donor population. And African Americans were thought not likely to donate at all. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And in 19, actually began in 1978, the Southeastern Organ Procurement Foundation came to me to find out if I would help them solve the African American donor shortage, but had no funds to support me in this effort. So I met with Dr. James Baton, and we looked at the data and realized that this is something that was so important that we needed to do something about it because of our predilection to hypertension and diabetes. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this points out that uh, in 1980, we obtained $500 from Howard University to survey 40 Washington, D.C. residents. And we actually identified the five reasons blacks are unwilling to donate and a strategy to overcome their reluctance to donate. And uh, the next slide points out uh, the fact that uh, the five obstacles. Uh, next slide. Number one, of course, is uh, the fact that with the $500 and a pilot study, uh, we were able to identify first, next slide, that transplant awareness was a big obstacle because the black population was not aware that we needed organs more than any other ethnic group, nor were they aware that our predisposition to hypertension and diabetes was the biggest obstacle. Second, uh, they also weren't aware that we needed transplants more than anybody else. The next slide points out that the second obstacle was religious myths and misperceptions. Uh, concerned that in that great getting up morning, you go to the pearly gates, uh, uh, that uh, you don't need your body. Uh, and whether you have one kidney, one wing, or your eyes or not, it's a new heaven and a new earth. And so uh, most religions are willing to say yes uh, to donation because it is in giving that you receive. It is in pardoning that you're pardoned. It is in dying that you're born to eternal life. The third obstacle, next slide, uh, has to do with the basic uh, uh, fear of meat, premature death. If I go to the hospital, they might be more interested with getting my organs and tissues than with uh, saving my life. And, of course, we now make sure that the person is dead before anybody talks to them about organ and tissue donation. Next slide points out that uh, medical distrust is a big reason in all ethnic groups, uh, concerned that uh, people of color have been used as guinea pigs uh, uh, for, for decades. And so overcoming this distrust is something that is critical. And then uh, next slide points out the, the fifth reason, racism, the concern that if you're a minority person of color, they're going to take your organs and give them only to white people. And uh, of course, that's an obstacle that we have to overcome to recognize that uh, we're all of the same race. We're homo sapiens, human beings. And therefore, uh, sharing organs is something that we must do. The next slide points out that uh, uh, this all started with the DC Organ Donor Program. Uh, and because of the Dow Chemical Company's initiative to give us money to go across the country, uh, which was successful uh, and tripled the number of people aware of the, uh, the need for transplants, we conceptualized... <coughs> Uh, the National Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program. The next slide points out that uh, as a consequence of, of, of this MOTEP vision that we created in 1991, uh, that uh, between 1993 and 2010, because of Congressman Lewis Stokes, Secretary of Health Lewis Sullivan, and John Ruffin, we received $16 million to go across the country, actually including uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, to take this message across the country that what worked in the African-American community will work in all ethnic groups and people of color everywhere. Next slide, please. Points out that uh, uh, 
therefore, we we targeted Latino Hispanics, Asians, African Americans, Pacific Islanders, Alaskan Natives, and Native Americans. The next slide uh, uh, points out that our mission was just to reduce the number and rate of ethnic minority Americans needing organ and tissue transplants. Uh, the next slide points out that uh, this National Minority Donor Awareness started out as a day uh, in uh, August of 1996. Uh, a proclamation by the U.S. Senate, which was signed off also by the District of Columbia, Mayor Anthony Williams, and also by the President of the United States, William Clinton. Uh, this then... Uh, led to the next slide, which points out that uh, uh, our goal was to increase the number of minorities, people of color, who donate, receive transplants, and decrease the need of transplantation by the adoption of healthy lifestyles. This is the part of it that becomes critical. Uh, changing lifestyles so we don't need so much transplants because of our predilection to diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and uh, obesity. Uh, we make up more than 60% of those in, people in need. And, of course, the number of people dying daily because of the shortage of organs, which has decreased from 22 when we first started this effort to now to 17. But that's still a lot of people dying every day. Next slide, please. And this shows how we went from uh, National Minority Donor Awareness Day in 1996 to National Minority Donor Awareness Week in 2012. And then as of 2020, uh, National Minority uh, Donor Awareness Month, which is what we celebrate now. Next slide, please. Shows that based upon uh, the success of these programs and these efforts, uh, blacks were rank ranked above whites and other mon ethnic minority populations as the number one ethnic group uh, in 2010. <clears throat> Along those lines, the Latino, Hispanic, and the black uh, community, actually, uh, between 2010 and 2012, were among the ethnic groups that had the uh, number one, number two ranks for organ donation for men within the United States. Uh, and this then, of course, is what we've been all about and why we're all here today, because we, we want to make a difference, a difference that we've made, but we want to continue to make. Thank you for the opportunity to share this presentation with you. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, without further ado, we're going to answer your questions. First, for Clive, what are some of the reasons minorities are at a higher risk of needing a transplant? Well, we have more hypertension, diabetes, uh, and obesity than uh, most other ethnic, group, ethnic groups, uh, certainly Latino Hispanic group uh, uh, and Na Native Americans uh, rival us, but we're among the, those who have so much hypertension and diabetes and obesity that we uh, need organs more than uh, other ethnic groups. Selena, what are some of the barriers the Latino community faces as candidates, recipients, and caregivers? I think the main barrier for our Latino community is um, there's always a language barrier. So we have to ensure that our staff reflects our population when we come to those who, who we're serving. So in approaching a family using the appropriate um, language and customs and cultural expectations, but also a majority of our Hispanic population is Catholic. And I think that there's a misconception that organ transplantation and donation is maybe not okay with the Catholic Church, where it's exactly the opposite. All three popes, um, previous popes, have all issued statements supporting organ donation and the gift of being an organ donor. So it's a lot of that education, um, dispelling some of those myths, but also meeting people where they are. We also see that Hispanic families are very large. So you can walk into a room to approach a family about donation. And there could be 15 people in that room or maybe sometimes 30 people in that room and identifying who to speak to, who are the decision makers and very quickly understanding the dynamics of a large group of people. So culturally, we have to go in knowing that, not be intimidated by that and be able to figure out ways to work with families where they are in that time of tragedy. Yeah, there's a lot of things to consider. 
And for Clive, following from Selena's question, can you elaborate on some of the barriers the Black community faces on both the transplant side and donation? Well, you know, uh, the, the issues that have been a problem is the basic, you know, when we looked at this issue to try to find out why we're so disproportionately afflicted and affected with diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. It was hard to find the, the real reasons. Institutionalized racism was thought to be one of them. But uh, as we looked at the reasons why uh, blacks and other people of color don't donate, we have found there were five reasons. First, the lack of transplant awareness, the fact that m many of our people of color aren't aware that we disproportionately need organs and transplantation than other ethnic groups. Then there are religious myths and misperceptions, fears that if you don't if you don't take your organs with you to the pearly gates, you won't be able to see your great mama in the air after. And uh, you only have one kidney, you only get one wing. And uh, of course, that's not true that just about every religion uh, believes that it is in giving that you receive. It is in pardoning that you're pardoned. It's in dying that you're born to eternal life. So it is the right religious thing to do. Then the fear of... Uh, Premature death. If I sign a donor card and I go to the hospital, they might be more interested in getting my organs and tissues than with saving my life. And so we have to overcome that myth. And then fourthly, there's the medical distrust. The fact that people of color has been used as guinea pigs in the past, and uh, therefore there's a great distrust of the medical system. And finally, an issue about racism that we need to put to rest, that uh, if you give your organs and you're a person of color, they're going to go to whites and, and not vice versa. Uh, and so these were the obstacles. But one of the things that we found out after we studied this uh, was that uh, we can overcome this by education, community education and empowerment. And this is what we've been doing for the past uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, and as a consequence, we've doubled the number of African-Americans who donate. And I'm sorry, we tripled the number of African-Americans who donate and doubled the number of minorities who donate. So uh, these are some of the reasons why uh, we still have an issue. And I think one of the ways to overcome this uh, issue is uh, uh, community education and uh, empowerment. And, and months like this go a long way to increase uh, uh, people of color's participation in organ donation and transplantation. And now back to Selena. New Mexico has a higher population of Native Americans. Can you talk to what New Mexico donor services is doing to support them and their families through transplants? Yeah, um, one in five of the people on our state's waiting list is Native American. So 20% of the people waiting for organs in the state of New Mexico are Native American. And we are blessed that our population as a whole has a very high registration rate, but among Native Americans, it's very, very low. And the cultural beliefs are much the same, that if you you give an organ, that there is something tying you to this earthly arena and that you won't pass on into the spiritual world. And so leaving a piece of you behind is, is not cult widely culturally accepted. We um, have a bunch of ways that we're working with our Native American population. We're doing it through art because art is a universal language. And I think everybody understands and can appreciate, especially in New Mexico, we have beautiful, amazing, talented artists. So we have a piece called Giver Receiver. And the image is of a Native American who has a heart in his hand. And he is, the, the impetus is that you don't know whether he's giving his heart or receiving one for the continuation of um, life within the culture and being able to continue and pass on those cultural beliefs and those values. The um, other thing we're doing is ensuring that the stories of transplantation, much like Dr. Callender stated, it has to be that transplantation works. So having ambassadors who are Native American who tell their stories of receiving transplants and show them literally while we're out in a community that like, look, I have a, a, a heart transplant and I have been living with this heart transplant for 15, 20 years, whatever it might be. But then also telling the stories of those waiting. Um, there is not a, a person within a tribal community that I have come 
to or approach that doesn't know somebody on dialysis waiting for a kidney. And so it's really being able to show that community what the need is, but also informing them that transplants work, that it's something you should consider, and that hopefully that then opens the conversation to becoming donors and learning more about donation. Hearing the uh, other ethnic groups that uh, uh, make up uh, uh, the, the national minority group, uh, the Latino Hispanics, the Native Americans, uh, the, the uh, Asian Americans, the Pacific Islanders, uh, Native Americans, and Alaska Natives as well. Uh, they all have uh, uh, very similar reasons for not being part of the transplant uh, registry and uh, donating. And so I think the most important thing that we can do is to go into the community as a uh, Chilino has identified, go into the communities and educate and empower them to become part of the solution. And the people who are the best uh, uh, spokespeople for that are people who actually donated or received transplants. Uh, they make a big difference. Uh, they must, they, when they speak, people listen and they change their minds and become part of the solution to the problem. So, uh, so if we can just get more minorities to uh, really understand and uh, appreciate the fact that we need organs more than any, anybody else, and therefore we need to become more and more a part of, of the solution to the problem. And that leads us directly to our fifth question for Dr. Clive. Why is it important for minorities to register as donors? R registering is so important nowadays because we know finally we got to the point where if you decide that you want to become a donor, regardless of your family wishes or anybody else's wishes, uh, it stands. And so you have the right to do it regardless of what your family wants. And so uh, registering, uh, you then uh, make a record of it so that if, if you should pass, uh, they can go into the registry, find out whether you wanted to be to be a donor or not. And then if you did register to become a donor, then it is automatic thereafter, whether your family likes it or not. And so registering, to me, is one of the most important advances that we've made in the last 10 years. And so to see the numbers going up is, is good to see, although we still have uh, uh, lower numbers of uh, people of color registering than in other ethnic groups. I would completely agree with Dr. Callender's um, statement and that it's so important, especially within our minority communities, that you do tell your family of your decision. So if you make that decision to become a donor because of the dynamics and the logistics and sometimes, you know, you have a family of, of Hispanics, who, of a Hispanic family who has 15 cousins and brothers and sisters and everybody who wants to have an opinion. If you've told them first person, look, I made this decision and I would like to be a donor, it alleviates so much of a burden on making that decision to your family. Native American communities as well, because it's not as open and openly discussed if you've personally made that decision to though go and then tell your family that I am a donor and here's the reasons why and then that helps uh, make sure that your wishes are fulfilled. When it comes to registering just know that we as organizations are always open to that question and that education and picking up the phone and just answering any questions that you might have but really knowing that the legacy you leave behind can continue your culture, can help your family, and really ensures that you are leaving a, a giant gift. Yeah, all these big questions seem to start at the dinner table. There can be a conversation with the family, and that's super important when you're discussing such big issues. And the last question that we have for both our panelists are, what are some ways the members of multicultural communities can get involved in the transplant community? You know, there's so many different ways. And of course, uh, one of the things that we like to do is to go into the community and get the communities to organize themselves and uh, then take the message out. And I think uh, what I've found over time is that the community is the most efficient agent to be able to do that. And so if uh, 
we can just get go to the community, educate the community, and let the community then uh, take the message to the rest of the community. That is likely the most effective way of doing it. Of course, that requires first to get into the community and to educate and empower the community. But I think that is the first step and a major step. And then, of course, finding those people in the community who actually have been donors or recipients or people waiting for transplants and let them ask and let them take the message to the rest of the community. As Dr. Callender said that education component is so, so important and finding those connect to purpose stories is, is vital. But I also think for us as working within the donation community, listening is so key. We have to listen to the community on how to meet them where they are, uh, what the cultural beliefs are, because in each tribe, it can be different. With each family, it can be different. And so really listening and understanding their needs and and questions and helping, letting them know that we are open to them educating us. We're not here to force anything on you, to force you to make any type of decision. We're here to have a discussion. And our ultimate goal is to save lives, period. And before closing, is there anything either of you would like to add to our discussion? Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that the number one problem in transplantation today is the shortage of donors, uh, that you've got close to 100,000 people who are waiting for organs, and we only do 40,000 transplants, so you've got 60,000 people. As a consequence, 17 people die every day because of the shortage of donors. And for this reason, uh, it's so uh, important for us to do, do what, exactly what we're doing today, to talk about how we can get all communities, the minority and the majority community, to become donors and living and in life and after death. So I think that is what makes this month so special, this day so special, and this program so special. And we at New Mexico Donor Services um, are completely willing and open to sharing all of the resources, the artwork, the tools that we have currently created for some of our different communities. So anybody that would like to see them or like to utilize them, we'd be more than happy to share, share that message, especially during this very, very important month. That brings today's session to a close. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their knowledge. Thank you for tuning into today's session to all of our viewers. My name is Jesse Rochelle and I am the executive director of the Chris Kluke Foundation. We hope you found, to, found today's session to be inspiring and informative. Again, if you have any questions for today's panel or want to learn more about this year's webinar series, please head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Live life, get life. <laughs>